our political leaders need to understand that the office, it's about the office, not the individual. And I think we have a very long way to go in understanding position of office. And even when you go in as a political leader, you go to serve an office. Yes. It's not about you. It has never been about you. Um, from where I sit, I do not believe it. Because even though it's mainly young people that voted for President Ruto, it has been mainly old people that have received the rewards from President Ruto. Again. <laughs> so maybe, yes, we need new leaders. But do you feel our democracy is regressing mm. or progressing? People, both opposing sides, come together and say, OK, fine, let's work together. But then as soon as the next administration kicks in, we find ourselves having the same issues the same conversations about exclusion or even people thinking or feeling that they've been left out of decision-making processes yes. and people not being involved. A very warm welcome to another conversation on Kenya Explained. My name is Esther Nyonje. With me today is the very brilliant, enthusiastic, what else, what else can I post there? <laughs> You're very enthusiastic. I really love your energy. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming to our show. Thanks for having me. Nerima Wako is the executive director of Siasa Place, and we are going to have a discussion with her today. And I'd like to know your mind, and just not only me. Very many people want to hear from you, or my viewers have been asking me. You should bring Nerima once oh, to your wow. show. Oh, thank you. So thank you for coming, and welcome, ladies and gentlemen. Keep subscribing to this YouTube channel watch, comment, share, and like. Mm -hmm. Now, Nerima, mm -hmm. the key words this week are bipartisan, mandamano, uh, truce, uh, the National mm -hmm. Reconciliation Act. Mm -hmm. what, what do you think would have happened if there was no truce? Supposing mm -hmm. there was no truce between Raila and Ruto, what do you suppose would have happened? Well, very tough questions, good questions. We had to have a truth. Um, when we look at the history of our country, we've had relationship issues between tribes for a while. And this is also because of how our parties have been structured. If we take it to even before not necessarily independence. Let me take it forward to succession paper number 10. Mm -hmm. And the whole idea of seceding and separating ourselves is because there are people in this country who feel they haven't had access to resources. All right. And it has been proven, especially before devolution, when resources were very centralized. centralized. And so we've seen development in some places in our country and we've seen how devolution has now brought development to others. Yes. So the truth is important because it's about us not dealing with our deep-rooted issues. And I say this because when we had post-election violence in 2007, 2008, and then uh, when Kofi Annan had to come and there was the National Peace Accord, which now even brought about the NCIC and the commission itself for peace. Um, it was also about inclusion. Yes. So even the handshake, um, there were several points, nine point agenda. Yes. But it also had an aspect of national values, inclusion, inclusion, fighting corruption. So again, if you listen, yes, you'll hear Raila talking about IBC, the electoral process, but he'll also share about high cost of living, and there's also this sense of inclusion. So I think that a truce is necessary for stability, and stability is what brings business. There's no way you can do business in a country in conflict. Mm -hmm. uh, there's no way you can continue with your work, you getting here to work, to having employment if your country is in conflict. You will be thinking about probably trying to find a safer place to live, a refugee, moving out of your own country. So you won't be thinking about building the country. So I think where we have gone wrong is 
we have seen a lot of solutions come to the fore but then we never take them seriously. We've seen the formation of BBI and then it died and disappeared. We saw the formation of IPPG and then it worked in the NAC Kenya, in the NAC uh, coalition, Rainbow, and then it disappeared. So I think the only thing I would say is out of this truce, um, whatever both sides agree to put on the table, whatever formations they want to call it, bipartisan, whatever, is not something that the next administration should do away with. I think the handshake, we started off and then we, we threw it to the side as soon as President Uhuru Kenyatta finished his term. Yes, and the same way you have taken us back to history and coming to explain that a truce was necessary at this point. Mm -hmm. We've seen the historic recurrence of this truce, the handshake and now and even from the first government. Now, do we, is, it, is it that this truce will be a sustainable measure mm. or it is a pain reliever for now? Because mm. for now it looks like something that is going to solve a situation mm. this time. So what can we do to make, to make the sustainable measures of this situation mm. that is happening? So I think that we have called a truce completely different things. So if you think of President Mwaki Baki's government, yes. we called it the coalition government. Co yes. And then when we came now to President Uhuru's Uhuru, government, so now we call it the handshake. handshake. Now this one is going to be called bipartisan truce. 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 Yes. So I do agree with you where it is seen as a bandage, where people, both opposing sides, come together and say, OK, fine, let's work together. But then as soon as the next administration kicks in, we find ourselves having the same issues, the same conversations about exclusion or even people thinking or feeling that they've been left out of decision-making processes, yes. and people not being involved in very important committees or in independent institutions. I believe that if this agreement or whatever they want to call it because they're saying it's not a negotiation, it's not, they're giving it all sorts of, but at the end of the day, there's going to be some document formed to share with the Kenyan people and I can guarantee you it's going to cover the same things across the board we have been discussing in the last almost 40 years and if we do not have the intentionality especially of carrying it forward being able to measure it yes uh, I'll give an example under President Mwaikibaki, I've shared that one of the four points that Kofi Annan said was the formation of an entity that looks at instilling cohesion and peace in the country. So the National Cohesion is formed, Committee of Inclusion. And now when it's formed, do you know that office only has one office here in Nairobi? They are not devolved since 2008 they don't have 47 offices in 47 counties, counties. so how are you doing inclusion in Nairobi <laughs> so that's how you find that even when they do press statements you know they'll say oh you know when there's that press statement of how to pangwingui is div divisive so if they had offices if they were supported if they were funded because they are not we would see a different kind of inclusion. You would see children actually knowing what NCIC is. Yes. Because let's say the office is in the county. Mm -hmm. It's in the county government. Mm -hmm. It's pale kwa grau na grassroots. Mm -hmm. So what I'm saying is there are decisions that have been made. Some of them make a lot of sense. We will refer to Kig the Krigler report. Mm -hmm. We will the talk about... Report. Yes, Waki report. But then... It's only that first year we will find, you know, our leaders putting structures in place. But that continuation of implementation is what lacks. Lacks. Yes. Because as soon as the next administration comes in, they no longer see it as a priority issue. They feel, no, that is not of importance to us. Yes. Not right now for us. Mm. Sasa, sisi ni watu wa hasla. Sisi ni biashara. Mm. Tunahama kwa hasla. You say first year, I say the first three months. <laughs> three months. The first trimester. <laughs> After three months, we go back to, back to siasa, and back to looking so for sad. tenders. Mm -hmm. And it's so sad. And you know, I think our political leaders need to understand that the office, it's about the office, not the individual. 
And I think we have a very long way to go in understanding position of office. And even when you go in as a political leader, you go to serve an office. Yes. It's not about you. It has never been about you. But in Kenya, the politics is opposite. It is about them. It is about feeling. It's about emotion. It mm -hmm. is about uh, this how person. much money I spent how, during my yes. campaign. And this person said this about me. Yes. Let me show you me how show I'm so macho. <laughs> so there's so much um, egotistic wars that make no sense to me. And I think that as soon as people begin to understand that it's about the office, so as soon as you come into office, you're able to see this is what this administration did, and these are the things that we need to continue, and these are the things that we need to stop. A lot of administrations come into power and they want to start everything brand new. Brand new. And so we lose that sense of continuity. Yeah. And so even after this truce, whatever we, we can get back to where we are again and now where are we now look at the bbi like mm. you just said it's provided a solution to some of the the niches that we are facing right now introduction of the opposition leader mm -hmm. uh, uh, winner take it all it would have kept the winner take it all now is it time that we amend the constitution was bbi mm. a good idea oh bbi <laughs> 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 I think the idea started well and then it lost track. It lost track. <laughs> hey, it went off the rails. When, How did it start well? Um, the whole idea of having national dialogue. Yes, yes. I think going about, to the counties yes. to consultation and bringing up all those ideas. Okay. I liked that idea. Yes. And I think the fact that the constitution is now 13 years, we should have a sense of a review, you know? How is it working? Is it working well or not? Because we've seen changes that have happened, like public participation or counties having their own public participation bills, not understanding or trying to find a way to figure out what is good public participation. There are things that the constitution doesn't have detailed responses to. Roles, you know, we have just began to understand the deputy president what exactly is that role what you know exactly is that role? so yes. that's something that is in the constitution but then it's not detailed yes on. It's, we've had to learn yes you've seen about article 37 everyone was interpreting it according to according to their side if, exactly. if kenya kwanza say it says it has limits as in your says no we have so i feel there's so many breaches in that constitution and exactly. as you say we can review the constitution. I think so. So that's what I liked about BBI. I think that the national dialogue is important because the constitution gives so much power to the people. Even the first chapter, we the people. It says that you as a citizen should be able to engage with it and your leaders. Mm -hmm. But then we lost it when it yes. now became very political. political. People now almost inserting themselves into the BBI, um, seeing certain positions for themselves within the BBI. And, and I think that's where uh, things began to just lose track. I do feel that there are some matters within the BBI that need to be brought to the fore. Yes. Um, such as the national values or even people pushing for language and accepting or appreciating Kiswahili more. I think there were some good things in terms of even culture. Uh, ethics, people. instilling ethics yes, in kids. Yes. yes. So there are some things I really agreed on. And it's unfortunate that the way it was being done, the political scenarios and situations were being prioritized much, much more than some of the things that um, citizens felt were of importance. So that's why I feel it, it dropped. Um, but I do think that there's an opportunity for that. Even right now, with the conversations with this truce, there's an opportunity to involve the Kenyan people. There's an opportunity for them to own the process and it not to necessarily be controlled by political leaders. Because when you touch on high cost of living, it's not the politicians feeling it. They don't know the price of unga. No, they don't. They don't. So why are they the ones at the center of the discussion? I think it should be opened up to people who are actually feeling the pinch. And this can be a process that if done well, there can be a sense of continuation. So it goes beyond 
political agendas. Yes. But it has to take leaders who want to open it up to the public and not to drive it as a political vehicle. Yes. And now uh, looking at, uh, I can say I am quite pessim pessimistic right now because we've seen a repeat of this happening again and again. Uh, when, when the president Ruto was supporting Raila against Kibaki, he came out to say, to convince Raila not to take, not to, to agree to any kind of agreement. Mm -hmm. And then when there was the, there was the grand coalition government, mm -hmm. There were people who were sidelined, mm -hmm. you see, and it brought it, it brought a sense of betrayal and rivalry, and that's how Ruto fell out with mm -hmm. with Raila because he didn't feel involved. He was supposed to be he was supposed to be in Raila's government in the other in the if Raila was president in two or seven, mm -hmm. Ruto was supposed to be a prime minister. Mm -hmm. Yes, now that truth cannot involve anyone and people have to be locked out, mm -hmm. you see? And then the politics keeps on playing again and again. And then we have the same names yes. again and again. <laughs> so yes. maybe, yes, we need new leaders. But do you feel our democracy is regressing mm -hmm. or progressing? That's right. Hmm. So because of the work that I do um, at Siasa Place, I work with a lot of youth. So the statistics on young people, especially 2022, who vied, the number increased by 1,000. 1,000 people between the age of 18 to 35. Who wanted to buy? Right. Yeah, wow. they were actually on the ticket. Not even the ones who are saying Nasimama, Natakusimama. They yes. were on the IBC yes. ballot paper. Yes. There was an increase of 1,000. So when I look at that, it was about 4,000 and something, something, something. Now, a lot of young people go for MCA, right? Because it's the low hanging fruit award is not so big i can manage resources maybe i can mobilize now that position um there were about 317 who are youth who made it they are elected they're in power now i'm not saying nominated 317 317 okay who are elected out of that 317 only 14 are women one four wow elected Nairobi, where you think it's the capital and we are more than only four women have been elected. And I think one of them even is Dago, only four. And another one is Madare. So what I'm saying is there's an increase of young people's participation in politics. So I think it's progressive because MCA position, you're seeing people who are 21, 22, they've been elected. Toto. And then you're seeing there are some who it's mainly men. But the public still cannot understand women rep. Mm -hmm. Why is women rep there? Why is it there? Why is it there? But if you look at the numbers, women are not being elected. So they'll come and tell you, but look at Nakuru County, all of them are women. But let me tell you, that is such an outlier. It is rare. If you look at Kitui County, only one woman was elected. If you look at our speakers, there's only one woman who's a speaker out of 47. If we were to look at the numbers, women is still very, very small in terms of actual elections and participation. Kitui County had to nominate only women because their assembly was full of men. These are the statistics of 2022. So again, I feel like it's regressive because we have a constitution that has affirmative action. Yes. But it seems to be working backwards in reality, where now women are being told, because you have women rep, leave these other seats. So you're finding even fewer women going for other seats. They're going for women rep. So it means now the only women who will be in government elected is women rep. So uh, when I see the names being repeated, it is a concern, but not really. Because even when I compare it to the U.S., a lot of our constitution has been copied from there. You will see the Clintons. I wouldn't be surprised if one of Obama's kids vies. The Kennedys have been vying for generations. Mm -hmm. I'm surprised that Trump is going to jail. I'm not quite sure what that's going to do. Because <laughs> I was sure he was going to vie again. Mm -hmm. You never know. Maybe one of his kids will. 
but it happens where there are families, monarchs, oligarchs that are normally the ones that circulate around power. Obama is one of those rare cases where he, he basically opened the door. But if you look at the family history of democracy, it's mainly for rich families and wealthy individuals to be able to make it. Dynasties. Dynasties. <laughs> it's, the, it's the system. It's the system. Mm-hmm. And, and that's going to happen in very many countries, not just Kenya. But where I do see um, a sense of not really relief. I see a lot of young people really coming to the front. Sakaja is not even 40, and he's the governor of a capital city. So when you see things like that, you can say, okay, there are some young people who have really been pushing through. Is Sakaja young? Yeah, compared to other politicians. <laughs> the age bracket for youth is 35. 35. I'm yeah. sure he's, he's 39. 30. You see? So he's, he's not 39. young. <laughs> so you don't consider him young? No, he's not young. Okay, so Sakaja has You know when you say about hired... young people, you're talking about Toto, you're talking about yourself. Okay. About me. Okay. In fact, uh, someone someone opened up to me in a conversation. Someone saw your post and said, do you know I wanted to pick Nerima as my running mate for a presidential post? Oh, wow. <laughs> so um, um, I don't know why I didn't see your name on the ballot. And then you see this person who, <laughs> I don't know, I don't know the name, but... He burned his ID card I because he was disqualified out Muziora. of the aura. Yes, you see. So when you talk about young people, uh, my mind is off Sakaja. <laughs> my mind is off Clofas Malala. These people are we're we're all, we're talk, we're talking, talking about like Nerima, we're talking about myself, we're talking about very I hear you. Yes, I hear you, you see. I hear you. So um I, I saw um Ben Suda stand up in parliament to say she's a youth and uh, Owen Bayer stood up and say no, the age bracket of a youth is clear. So politicians want to incline themselves to this part of uh, we are youth, but no, we know they're not youth. We want to see the young, vibrant youth. You see Toto, mm. you see Salasia, mm. uh, you see who else? Sang, yes, Governor mm. Sang, uh, the deputy governor for Muranga County. Yes. You see, now this are youth. But now, if you look at, like, you, you gave me a statistic of uh, the youth who tried to vie in the last general election, and there were so many. Now, what is the stake of youth in, in national politics, mm. engaging in national politics? Because there is too much competition. Mm. There is too much that you need. Now, if someone, if a youth wants to vie, if, if person X says, I want to pick Nerima Wako as my running mate, and then you come out and say, yes, this is our coalition, and then people don't take you as a joke. You know, if you go vie for that position in, in the public, people take you as a joke. Now, can we get to that? What do you think about getting to that place where youth are taken with so much weight in politics? They have to prove their weight. Uh, power has to be taken. It's never given. And I think that the people who have made it where they are at a young age, they've earned it. They've shown their stripes. And unfortunately for me, I've, I've been in rooms with very powerful people and even you negotiate, you even have an agenda. This is what you're going to say. You're going to say this. As soon as that leader walks in, you start the meeting. Do you know, I've seen it. They walk in, people are starstruck. They don't even know what they're saying. They've even forgotten their words. And then the other thing I've seen, we will run for our phones and take selfies. And this is the same person. You're so upset. But you know, you, am I lying, Esther? See, even you have seen it. Even I myself, I go for sales. You see, no, you, you see, no, I don't agree with this leader, but you meet them and, oh, no, you let's see. take a selfie with you. And then you're just like, whoa, 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 people have brains like, like, I don't know, fish, like they forget. <laughs> so even me, I can't take you seriously. There are some who, if they have an agenda, they have a movement, you know, and they structure themselves, they will be taken seriously. You will find them even in boardrooms making serious decisions and people, they don't play because they've seen, by the way, this one won't be distracted by money, won't be distracted by fame, won't be distracted by influence. As soon as we do that, you will see youth in national politics yes. like this. Yes. yes. Now, ladies and gentlemen, uh, and the youth to the youth who are watching, you've had, you've had, I mean, we need to take ourselves and uh, take ourselves to a place where the older generation can believe with us. That's what you're saying, mm-hmm. Grace. So keep subscribing to this YouTube channel as we watch. And as we continue with this conversation, um, 
on the same on the same breath Mm -hmm. uh, there's still an ongoing conference about uh, social protection and inclusion of uh, women, youth and persons with disability. Do you feel the president's agenda is on track with inclusion of these groups? You've mm. said that only 14 women, only 14 women uh, were successful with your list. We've seen the cast positions, we've yes. seen uh, the cabinet positions. Very few women. Very few. Now, is, is this two-third gender rule inclusivity of... Um, in fact, in the cabinet, there is no person with disability. Mm -mm. You see, mm -mm. so is this is this a fairy tale we're talking about? Is it chasing a wild goose story about two-third gender rule? Mm. Youth is there youth in cabinet? Uh, there is one, but I've forgotten his name. But there's one. There's one PS. All right. Mm. But I don't. I don't believe it. You know, on paper. There's this whole agenda of supporting two-thirds. Yes, you remember the president signed uh, yes, a yeah, charter. The charter, youth charter, yes, women's youth charter. charter, women charter. But then when you see the images of the meetings that he has even at State House, or you will hardly, you'll hardly see even young people or people with disabilities or women. You can find an all-male panel. And people will say, ah, what does that have to do with anything? It has to do with a lot. Because it means that people have access. A lot of the major decisions, they happen in boardrooms. If you're not seen, if you're not in the boardroom, you're not part of the agenda. And that is a concern for me. Even though he created the docket of advisor to the president on women, which is now uh, being led by Harriet Chigai, I'm yet to see what is going to be the fruit of that office in terms of even coordinating with CS Aisha. I don't know. So for me, I think that they have a lot of proving to do. Um, from where I sit, I do not believe it because even though it's mainly young people that voted for President Ruto, it has been mainly old people that have received the rewards from President Ruto. And so in closing, even the caste position, as unconstitutional as it is, and the court even saying that, 23 of them under President Uhuru Kenyatta, caste had seven young people, seven. I can confirm, below the age of 35. Some who I worked with, some who I'm friends with. And they have done amazing work for many of them, not all. In this government, for CAS, you have up to 50. And I'm not even sure if there's one youth. So you want to tell me that president has youth at heart? No, it's clear. It is as bright as day. And, and CAS was also a position for young people to understand the function and process of government. Many of them, I'll talk about David Yossiani, where he was very involved in trade and even brought about, he learned that there were youth who were paying 15,000 for internship. He removed that. I can, I can tell you things that he has done that I have seen. But if a cast is not even caring about young people, they're not going to see the pinch of it. They're never going to know attachments are being paid for in this government. They're not going to even try and get rid of it. Mm. And even in my sector for youth, when the PS was announced, we were like, who is PS Ismail? Like, who is this guy? And where did he come from? And does he even understand youth? Has he tried to? Does he care to? Because as we speak, there's the National Youth Council bill. It's going through an amendment. And they're talking about depoliticizing youth. The National Youth Council, we were supposed to have elections two years ago. And it is basically, in every single ward, they should be a representative of the National Youth Council, voted by the youth themselves. It is like a whole other election that IBC manages. The board has been unconstitutional in years. The CEO, we have an acting CEO. Mm -hmm. The CEO was moved mm -hmm. 
Tungek recently, affirmative action for women. So what I'm saying is the youth sector mm-hmm. itself mm-hmm. has so many gaps, but you don't even see a lot of goodwill mm-hmm. in terms of trying to fix those gaps. All right. Now, how do you, you say yourself, uh, sometimes you don't take youth seriously. Now, how do you strike the balance, even an advice to the youth, how mm-hmm. do you strike this balance between a point where I can be taken seriously and uh, a point where we're getting goodwill from the government? Mm. A lot of times we work with youth groups, especially in the counties that we work in. So before we enter a county, we'll do a mapping. We'll come to the county government, we'll go to the county itself, and we see who are the active youth groups. It can be border border circles, chamas, church groups, football, any, which are the active ones. And then once we get an idea, we get up to maybe a hundred. Mm-hmm. Then we invite them to a meeting All right. and we say, Hi, we're Siasa Place, this is what we do. Yes. Are you interested in learning about how government works? Uh-huh. And out of that meeting, we get some youth who are serious. Okay. And we capacity build them. All right. And then they are able to now build their own influence in the community. Mm-hmm. Some of them vied for MCA. Some of them won. So that's how I find who a serious youth, youth is. is. Okay. They show in themselves that this is something I want to do. All right. We don't force youth not to do what they don't want to okay. do. Okay, all right. Now there's something about um, uh, the civil society. Mm-hmm. Uh, the civil society has been seen to... Do you feel the civil society is observing truth over neutrality mm. with all that is happening? Because at one point you see the civil society come, they don't come to just choose a leader and mm. back a leader that they believe champions for their beliefs and values. They want to, p- to play the neutral bit. Mm. So at one point you'll see them uh, saying, uh, Raila should stop the mandamanos, you see? And then at the other point you see them saying, we want to be put on the negotiation table about the bipartisan mm. negotiations. So what do you think, and how is even Siasa Place working mm. with the civil society mm. to make it vibrant mm. and make it choose a truth? Mm. over neutrality i think civil society has been branded as you know not doing much especially more recently because what has happened is civil society was very vibrant in the 90s when we were fi- when we were yes. fighting multi multi parties mm. yes. and then a lot of these leaders ended up entering government from kivutha kibwana to james orengo i mean anyang nyongo a lot of them Karua. They, they entered government and what we didn't see was an intentional grooming of the next generation of civil or civic society actors. So there's this gap because even when we look at our um, universities, a lot of times when we read about the history of activism and civil society, it started on campus for very many people. So they either entered government or they entered civil society. But now on campus, you can't even find leaders in campus. Some of them have the very interest of entering politics to make money. It's not about servitude. Yes. So I think that in 2022, Mm -hmm. some civil society organizations picked a political side and it cost us. I think it tainted an image because people now felt like your voice is supposed to be neutral. But our voice in civil society has never been neutral. It has never been. The church was part of civil society in fighting for multipartism. They picked a side against a dictator. Civil society has never been neutral. But the notion that civil society is supposed to be neutral has what has created this redundancy or complacency, where now they feel afraid to, to touch things, they don't want to be too political, they, they want to be good to everyone. Now because of that, you find that both sides are able to take advantage of it. And we've even seen the church being split. Yes. Yeah. You'll find the church pushing for mandamano and you'll find the church saying no mandamano. And I think there needs to be a side that is picked and it should be the side that stands on the constitution. I think as soon as we pick that side and people and the public understands that that is the side that we're all on, 
civil society will get the trust from the public again. Right now, it has lost a lot of trust. And also, the way we fight has changed. Right now, when civil society is fighting, we go to court. We go to court. You won't find us protesting anymore, not as much as they did in the 90s. Mm -hmm. There have been so many court orders that have been ignored by the previous administration and this one. Yes. Even with CAS itself, the next day people in the office. In the office. And that disrespect for the ju judiciary is what is going to harm the Kenyan people in the end. Mm -hmm. Because your last form of defense is your courts. Mm -hmm. They're the ones who are able to protect you mm -hmm. from the executive, which yes. is a very powerful arm. So I think going forward, we do have to change tactic, not just going toward the judiciary. Because the Kenyan people, they don't see it. It's not visible. Going to court is not as visible as a demonstration. It's not. But you want the same result. So I think we need to go back to not just having demonstrations. I need there needs to be more awareness on what civil society is actually doing. Yes. What they are pushing for. Yes. And the public understanding that. I yes. think that has missed. Yeah. Yes. And I'm looking forward to seeing um a, a, for, a forum a organization like Siasa Place mm -hmm. taking in place vibrantly to push over what you're talking about in place of civil society mm. yes and now uh, and to that uh, mm -hmm. Siasa Place was formed in 2015 maybe you can tell us a little bit about Siasa Place uh, your main role and the impact that mm -hmm. your sec uh, the impact of your sector yeah sure so Siasa Place we actually started online um, volunteering with a group of friends we were about seven of us and we started by having conversations about what's happening in the country. So you started as a group or an individual? As a group, like as a group. So I was away with school. I was in the US for about seven years. Mm -hmm. So when I came back, I didn't have friends. <laughs> All my friends from primary, secondary, them they've had moved on. They've moved on with life. Yeah. So I had to almost start over yes and i knew that i liked governance and politics so i used to attend you know the way you can be at hilton or a hotel in tao or stanley and you're seeing organizations like cmd having meetings with politicians about elections i used to attend those meetings okay okay and then it's out of those meetings i began to meet people especially young people who have interest in governance. So now, that's how I met these people. I didn't know them before. It was only one who was my cousin, and she was good in design, Miriam, um, that I roped in. So we would have um, meetings in Tao at Londro House. Uh, there was a tea, like a cafe, and we would be like, what are we discussing in the country? So the way you're talking to me today mm -hmm. about this bipartisan, mm -hmm. we would sit down, seven of us, mm -hmm. and we're just like, what do you think about this? What do you think about that politician who said that? Mm -hmm. And we would wonder, are other youth having this conversation? Yeah. What Bef forums are they using? Uh, yeah, what forums are they using? Where are they? Where can we meet them? Mm -hmm. And so, we couldn't find them. And because we are not on campus, <laughs> we have finished school. So we just decided to start having them on Twitter. And so when we would start having conversations on Twitter, that's when now people started inviting us mm -hmm. to forums. Mm -hmm. Hey, you better come to archives. We're having this conversation today. Join us. And it started to grow like that. And so we would find, hey, more people are following us. People are inviting us to Maseno. People are inviting us to Nakuru. And that's when now we decided, let's register. And we registered as an NGO now right. in 2016. Wow. Yes. And so now we work in 12 counties and we work with the county government. And our role is just to make uh, better engagements for youth. Okay. So we will have football tournaments, festivals, whatever, mm -hmm. even barazas. Mm -hmm. But that baraza is led by youth. Okay. And they are discussing the issues in the community mm -hmm. with their local MCA and coming up with solutions for their community. Mm -hmm. so, so that's what it has, it has grown to be.
Yeah. And your impact, you can, you can tell us about the impact of Siesa Place mm. from 2015 until now. Mm. We have managed to put budgets for youth in Kericho County once there was absolutely no budget that went directly to youth programs. So budgets that have been approved to go to the 30 youth. million from international annually. organizations. No, from the, from government, the government itself. Okay. Yeah. Are from you working with international organizations also? Yes, mm -hmm. a number. We mm -hmm. work with a number of donors from the US to Netherlands um, to the UK. So mainly foreign. Okay. But then we also partner with the county government where we say we are able to support this much for public participation. Can you help us support the rest? And they do. Mm -hmm. Especially wow. when they see the seriousness of the young people that come and engage them. Mm -hmm. uh, we've seen youth joining boards in the county government. From Siasa Place. Yes. Okay. We've seen youth being elected MCA, uh, three of them in 2022, youth that we worked with. And I guarantee you, the youth that we start working with this year will be elected in 2027. Oh, I, really? I, yeah, I guarantee wow. you. Wow. Yeah. So someone could be out there wondering, uh, I'm interested in governance, uh, I'm interested in politics and uh, our discussion and Shiasa Place. So if uh, a youth is out here mm -hmm. asking how can I be part of Shiasa Place, how, okay. can do, how can they do that? Sure. So it's on our website at um, www.siasaplace.com uh, or any platform. We're on Facebook, we're on Twitter, we're on Instagram, we're on TikTok, we're everywhere. There normally is a tab on the website for membership. So you just register. So what that does, anytime there's an activity in your county, you will find out about it and you're welcome to come. Number two, we have a lot of um, challenges. Like there's one we're going to be releasing at the end of this month to write a story about what's happening in your community. Um, what was discussed in the last public participation meeting. You can write it in the form of an article, an essay, which is less than 500 words. Or you can draw it because we have a lot of artists who submit amazing work uh, to us. And you can win up to 20,000 shillings for just doing that. Um, mm -hmm. So we like to appreciate young people who are engaging mm -hmm. and also see it as an opportunity in terms of documentation. And then number three, there's always conversations. Conversations. You can learn. We have a lot of Facebook Live conversations, Twitter spaces conversations. Instagram. Even once we are doing now? Yeah, even right now. Mm -hmm. And so the conversations are always around a certain topic. All right. And so you can learn from them. Even someone even said once, we were having conversations about Nigeria. Uh, and their election, and even we want to have about what's happening in Senegal. So it's not just Kenya. So it's to look at the broader Africa and what's going on and what youth are doing and how they're organizing. And so we've even had youth reach out to us and say, may I know about this subject, put me in that panel, and we put them. So it's just about what's of interest to you. Mm -hmm. And Karibu, if we're in your county, you know, reach out to us and come to our events. You're very welcome. All to. right, mm -hmm. right. Thank you so much for this conversation. Thanks. I am inspired and I hope <laughs> viewers are also inspired. You have a CSA member in me. Uh, after this, I'm going to join CSA Place. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you Thank so you. much for coming. Mm -hmm. Thank you viewers for supporting us until this time. Thank you for watching and keep on subscribing to this YouTube channel. Like, share, comment, and until next time, see you.